What is up, everybody? You are watching NASA in Silicon Valley live for Thursday, December 20th, 2018. I am your host, Matt Buffington. And as my co-host, we have, you might recognize her from our Halloween episode. You also might recognize her <laughs> sultry voice from our Star Wash video. We have our very own Danielle Carmichael over here. Hey, Matt. <laughs> I, I, I told her I had something in store for the, for the introduction, but... Didn't want to spoil it completely for us. So. How's it going, Danielle? <laughs> you know, it's it's going great. I can't I can't wait. We're gonna have a really exciting show up for us today. Well, we have a fun unboxing episode for you guys. You see, sporting my kind of ugly Christmas sweater going on over here. Don't mind the reindeer floating in space. See, Danielle, you got your you got your necklace going. <laughs> she came out with just the she came out with just the polo shirt, and I was like, I want more Christmas, more stuff. <laughs> So, but speaking of having more Chris, we have Dave sitting on over here, and I promised Dave that I had this hat for him. So, well, you think you think I'm not quite Christmassy enough? Is that I, what you're I saying? I felt like we needed to turn up the Christmas uh, a little bit more. See, look at that. That so, is pretty awesome. To the to the right, to the yeah, left. What are you thinking? Think, We're good. I think We're you're good? good. All right. I think it works. So, if folks, if you can't tell, uh, <laughs> it is the holidays here, and we are excited and getting into the holiday spirit. And we're going to be opening up a whole bunch of gifts today. This is the unboxing show that you have all been looking forward to. Um, we have a whole bunch of different gifts that are unique to NASA's Ames Research Center in Silicon Valley, and this is going to be pretty crazy. We have a whole bunch of people lined up with. With, uh, boxes that we're going to unwrap. So awesome! We've got so much tremendous stuff here. Yeah, it's going to be great it's, stuff. It's going to be a fun time. But if you didn't know, this is NASA in Silicon Valley Live. It is a conversational show out of NASA's Ames Research Center here in Silicon Valley, where we talk to the various scientists, researchers, engineers, and all-around cool people at NASA, where we talk about all of the nerdy NASA news that you need to know about. And if you like that, we are right now live on twitch.tv slash NASA, as this wonderful lower third indicates. Um, <laughs> we're also live on Facebook and YouTube. But if you want to participate in the chat live, you have to go to twitch.tv slash NASA. And we are going to be collecting those questions throughout the episode. So you come on in, like, type in your questions. We're going to answer as many as we humanly possibly can. If you can't catch us live, that's no big deal. We will be on demand immediately when the show is over. We'll also be on reruns on NASA TV. And if you're an audio podcast listener, we will be on podcast services throughout the solar system and beyond. But I was going to tell you, if you're sitting on the 101 or on the 5 in traffic, uh, or if, if you're in D.C. on 95, this is probably the episode that you're not going to want to listen to. You're going to want to watch this. Yeah. we got a lot of cool stuff. Um, but our guest, we have... Dave Korsmeyer. He's <laughs> How's it going, Dave? Do, do we, thank you, thank you. Do, I Doing think we well. have a fancy lower third for Dave, too, right? I think we do. Yes. Hello. He is the Ames Associate Center Director for I Tech. I haven't figured out how to do this yet. I'm getting there. No, I'm correct. Nice. All right, I'll get there. So not only is it the holidays, Dave, this is also a special birthday. It is. Did you know? Did you know that today is the 79th birthday of one NASA Ames Research Center? Nice. nice. Very important. It is to this exact date. To this exact date that 79 years ago, we were founded as part of the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics. We were around. We are so old. We are so esteemed <laughs> that we were before NASA. Before NASA. Before, before NASA, NASA existed. There and was before Silicon Ames. Valley. <laughs> before <laughs> Silicon Valley. And was Silicon Valley was just Orange Valley, Orange Grove Valley. Yes. We existed before that. We were, we were the second uh, NASA advisory committee. Uh, National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics Center. The first one was in Langley, mm -hmm. uh, which is in Hampton, Virginia. Yep. It was okay. set up there, and they had all these kind of radical people that um, didn't get along and had these crazy ideas. Uh, no, that's not entirely true, <laughs> though they did. But they said, hey, we need another site on the other side of this, uh, yeah. the, the, the country. And they set us up here at Moffett Field. And yep. we were founded 79 years ago. And uh, we have been doing phenomenal, uh, wide value, uh, incredibly breakthrough research since that time. We're starting our 80th year right now. 
Yeah, um, that's right. It's just tremendous stuff. You're kicking off because it's the 79th <laughs> birthday, but yeah. coming into this next year is going to be 80 this is years. A big year. this is what we got we got uh, the Apollo 50th. We got the yep. NASA 60th itself. Yep. And then, uh, you know, of course, the most important is the Ames 80th. Yes, of <laughs> course. This time next Clearly year, we'll be doing the same important. thing. This is the big one. I mean, well, let's all put it in perspective, Matt. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to have it, Jim, it, at Jim Bridenstine talking to us about, oh, yes, about having an agency Jim perspective. Jim if you can see that episode. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, so, um, well, this whole episode, we're going to be bringing out people who are going to be bringing out gifts and talking about the different um, gifts, as you could say, that NASA Ames has contributed to NASA's mission. But of all of the things, Dave, what would you what would you come up with? Like, what is the most impactful or your favorite? What, what, what comes to mind when you think about the gifts uh, that has been given? So Ames is the gift that keeps on giving. We <laughs> have done so much over the years. Um, you know, you asked me this question, and I, I can't, I, I literally cannot come up with one. <laughs> well, we were some of the first in hypersonic research. We were the first that came up with a blunt body that uh, basically the shape of the spacecraft so you can come into the atmosphere and slow down. We did the first uh, high-performance supercomputing. We do quantum computing now. We had the first telescope in the back of an airplane. Uh, we do uh, thermal protection systems to allow us to slow into the atmosphere. We do the first AI in space. We have done so much here, and we will continue to do so much. We do the air traffic management software tools for the rest of the NASA and the FAA. So the phenomenal breadth of the stuff we do here, space biology, astrobiology, uh, life sciences, uh, it's just it's, it's mind-boggling, which is why it's such a great place to work. Why NASA yeah. is still number one in the federal government to be the best place to work. That, yeah. that was a reason. Yeah, yeah. Really and nice. a little-known fact, and I'm not sure well-documented because it's probably not, uh, Ames is the best place to work within NASA. Ooh. Oh, really? Oh, yes. Really? Yes, you may not know that, but I will assert that until proven otherwise. Until, so, <laughs> I, I, until you have empirical evidence. <laughs> well, I let others deal with that. Nice. Yes. Well, I do have to say, can we get a first shout out from Little Fox One? He said, hi, Dave. So cool in the hat. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. This is one of my better looks. <laughs> we, we had another sleepy underscore Gary was like, Santa hat. <laughs> and I like Tyrannus <laughs> Games with the number one from Fortnite. That's an awesome emote that you have going on there. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, like, so we're looking at the 80th, a um, whole bunch of stuff that, that Ames has been working on. So, and you've talked about a lot of the accomplishments, things that that Ames has done. What do you have? What are you thinking going forward? What's kind of so, what do you yeah, like? Actually, that's one of our big things. Is we're looking at we just finished our, our first 79. We're in our 80th year. What are we going to do in our next 80? Right? I mean, that, that's the real challenge. It's a real challenge for NASA, too. Just finished our first 60. What are we going to do in our next 60? We have so much to do. You know, the great thing about space is there's always more of it. Yes. You can always go farther up. Yes. Right? We it's did not just a clever orbit. name. No, we did uh, higher Earth orbit. We do, we're, now we're going, we're going to put a lot more stuff in the it's called cis lunar space between the yeah. Earth and the moon. We're gonna, we have things going up on Mars. We just landed inside on Mars. Ames was part of that, doing the analysis for how to get into the yeah. Martian atmosphere. Right? They're putting a, a Mars quake sensometer in there. It's, a, it's great stuff. We've got so much more to do. There's the ocean worlds you're going to do. Have you guys done a, a, a thing on the ocean worlds yet? I think Not. it's in the works. Of, I, gotta, think so. right? I think it's upcoming. This is, there's, there are, there are to get many ready for moons, the 2019 <laughs> many episodes. moons and planets in our solar system that have much more water than we do. You got it. This, the stuff we can do well, is just fun. And to that, that's also another uh, another uh, shout out. And Kayvon is over in the chat on <laughs> at NASA. So for the folks, if you're putting in those questions, Kayvon is actually the at NASA. So be nice to him. Oh, but yeah. also there's a shout out for Danielle. We had the more planets than stars <laughs> video that Kevlar. Danielle did. I forget Kepler, of course. We've discovered so much that literally there yes. are more planets and stars in the universe and in the galaxy, and it's just mind-boggling. Yeah, so it's like, and we, and we have a couple of people who are going to be coming on out <laughs> talking about that. We're going to be talking about aeronautics, space biology. We have a whole slew of things. So we're, we're stoked. This is going to be fun. It's going to be great. It's, and it's you know what? The, uh, the actual people that know are, are hiding behind They're, the walls over there. Yes. People on, 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 <laughs> who are in the chat, are in the chat, you can't really see it, but just over that way, we have a whole room full of people who are on deck. So speaking of which, are we about time, Danielle? We need I to move along? It, I think it is. I think it's finally time for us to say goodbye, Dave. Oh, I really appreciate that. I'm going to have to return yes, the hat the to hat you. I, I understand that. It, it uh, serves a purpose. Right. There's there's a role for the hat uh, yes, while indeed. I'm gone. And, and I think... Thank you so much for including me. It was great fun. 
um, uh, on behalf of Ames, I uh, appreciate the uh, the viewing audience. And <laughs> Lord, look at my hair! But that's okay. <laughs> it's all a part of the experience, Dave. <laughs> Everything. Appreciate it, Matt. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for coming, dude. So, don't forget, we have a new site where you can get all the information about our show schedule, links to our past episodes, as well as checking out some of these old episodes. And you can visit our URL. It's going to be nasa.gov/ames. Uh, NASA in Silicon Valley Live. All right, so while we're we're waiting for the next person who's on deck to be coming on over, I think Kayvon's going to be sending them on, on over the way. Um, so I think it's about time. So let's go ahead yeah. and welcome out Bring Kimberly. Out. Oh. Oh. And we have Kimberly. There we go. Oh. The gifts begin, folks. All right. Our, and one of our returning Jeopardy champions, folks. <laughs> How's it going? Special gift for you. Excellent. Bring and it on over. Thank you. And so, and you have to get if you can't get on the on the shot, you have to get that. That is an amazing yeah. shirt that we have going on. Not my shot. Yeah, that's a shirt. <laughs> we all love Pluto. Everybody <laughs> loves Pluto. Hey, wait, so. Is that a little New Horizons that I see up there as yeah, well? Yeah, this is New Horizons flying by Pluto. <sighs> oh, excellent. So the heart. <laughs> we, we, we got to jump into the unboxing. And as I said, so at least for me, and I don't know about for y'all, but at my house growing up, when you opened up gifts, you had to wear the Santa hat. It was just a rule, so that I'm going to maintain that the Santa hat has to come when you're doing the gifts. So, the first one. Wait, hold oh, on, hold oh, on, go on. For Before it. we get started, please, Kimberly, introduce yourself yes, to our audience. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you do here. I'm uh, Dr. Kimberly Enrico Smith. I'm a research astrophysicist here at NASA Ames. So, as an astrophysicist, I'm studying the universe, but I also and I also design and review missions uh, for NASA to send into space to do astrophysics. Okay, so solar system and beyond. <sighs> well, even like the first the, the first chat question that comes right out for Kimberly was like, "Will we see a moon landing in our lifetime?" That's from Prog Champ from Digital Donger. So, well, absolutely. In fact, um, there is a landing that's going to happen on the far side of the moon um, by the Chinese Space Agency next month, which is going to be awesome. They're going to do a sample return from an ancient impact crater. And so we're all the world is looking. Um, exploration of the moon is happening today. We have um, orbital assets involved and landers. In the future, yes. Excellent. Many. That's going to be so awesome. Are we, are we ready to rock and roll? Or keep I doing think chat? so, Matt. Go ahead. Okay. So, and, and also, as I've, I've learned, they told me to do not shake any of the gifts that come out. And this is probably, <laughs> this is quite amazing. Is so I'm going to pull this bad boy on out of here. And this is very delicate. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh, and we're going to toss that box just over here. So, Kimberly, why don't you tell everybody, what are we looking at? Well, Matt, <laughs> well, Santa did not bring you coal. No, but it looks a little, it's slightly different. You have an uh, moon rock. This Wait. is an, uh, this an is authentic a, this is a, moon rock. This is, a, this is real, right? This is real. This is from Apollo 15. Um, the fourth landing that we did with humans on the moon, and it's a sample return. Um, rare, precious, beautiful, um, 3.4 billion years old, taken from the elbow crater. Just a piece of history and a piece of solar system history. Okay, you know, I think we have a really cool photo that was part of this mission. So, hey, Bill, can we get that brought up on screen, please? Ooh, look at that. Ooh. Yeah, you're, you're looking at astronaut um, um, Irwin. Um, actually, um, Apollo 15 was the first of our lunar um, human explorations of the moon where we were doing proper geology. And you see him um, digging a trench. These are geolo geology's tool, geologists' tools um, and excavating rocks. Um, the later Apollo uh, missions had the rovers that extended the range for the astronauts to collect a variety of rock samples from so many different terrains and gave us fresh new insights into um, the moon. Wow. And as I recently learned, there's also a lot of paperwork that goes into <laughs> keeping yes. this very moon rock yes. here on campus. <laughs> and it also has a history. You yeah. think you look at this piece of rock, you say, oh, it's a piece of rock, something in my backyard. But just think of what it took to get something like this and bring it back to us for us to study. I mean, first, we had to design a rocket to leave the Earth to get to the moon. And so we had to you know, design the technology to escape the Earth's gravity. 
Then we had to travel a quarter of a million miles to get to the moon and know to actually, you know, get near the moon within mm -hmm. a reasonable amount of time and with accuracy. Mm -hmm. Perhaps then orbit the moon, then land on the moon, land safely, no big crunch, then go excavate and sample and then bring it back, leave the moon, come back to the earth and then survive reentry. A lot of things had to happen to yeah. make this. Uh, so the chat is is all about like having questions. There's one person, Sorex. Sorex is asking, is the cheese from the moon any good? Which is a ridiculous question because we learned on the <laughs> at Jim Bridenstine oh, yeah. episode <laughs> that the moon is not made of cheese. It is made of barbecue spare ribs. Yes. <laughs> so I would recommend you go into the on demand on the Twitch chat and you will find that one. Um, Kimberly's laughing. Therefore, well, I assume like, that that is accurate. One of my um, all time favorite uh, characters is Wallace and Gromit. Are you nice. familiar with Very the version? So. And they do a picnic on the moon because, you know, <laughs> as British characters, they want to have their, you know, their tea and they'll have cheese and biscuits and nice. because they go to the moon because it has cheese. And so, this is um, um, basalt. Um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> it's a, a rock that would have been created from a volcanic eruption on, on the moon. Um, and so it has a lot of uh, similarities to earth minerals, but they tend to be higher. Um, the moon rocks tend to be higher in iron and magnesium than their earth equivalents. So um, rare. Um, rare entity here. So a couple quick questions. I see Space TV Net is a reoccurring guest over in the chat, so welcome back. Was asking, how can I buy that rock? I'm going to guess uh, that you yeah, can't. You can't. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> but then another person, this is, uh, oh, let me see. Oh, it moved around. Um, Mini Meep one asks, what types of hand-on things has Kimberly done at NASA? And I was going to say, the Pluto shirt isn't just there for, you know. Oh, yeah. You have a special affinity for Pluto. <laughs> um, in a previous incarnation of things I do at NASA, because working at NASA, I get to work on a variety of different missions. And I was very privileged to work on the um, New Horizons mission that flew by Pluto. And New Horizons is going to fly by a very um, old and ancient um object in the outer solar system called MU69 on New Year's Day. So on January 1st, stay tuned for the uh, furthest uh, spacecraft encounter with a body in our solar system, MU69. But yeah, I worked on Pluto, beautiful planet, um, <laughs> geologically active, totally full of surprises. No one expected a world that's the third yeah. of the size of the moon to be so active with glaciers. Um, yeah. And um, I was also fortunate to work on a, a mission um, a, a few years ago where we deliberately intersected with the moon and we discovered water and changed the way we're thinking about um, how uh, resources are on the mm -hmm. moon and uh, where water came from. Um, from the uh, original uh, measurements of the Apollo samples, yeah. they were dry. Um, what's also very, um, but with these uh, recent robotic explorations of the moon, we've gone back with more modern instruments and we've been able to map and look at different mineralogy. And um, of the last five robotic missions, Ames has led yeah. three of them. Oh, awesome. And Shout we've gone global Ames. composition. <laughs> we then, with the impactor mission that I worked on, I built the payload for that. We crashed into the moon and uh, we discovered water. And uh, again, changing the way we do textbooks, uh, understanding the moon. It's also kind of interesting. Apollo 15, you're looking at the sample here. Yeah. Um, during that mission, even recently, um, researchers have taken uh, samples from the Apollo 15, 16, 17, and uh, reanalyzed them with modern instruments. And were able to show that they also have water, which had not been, you know, measured. And it turns out um, it's a sampling sensitivity. Our instruments now, our labs today, have much better sensitivities, so we can even probe down to um, smaller concentrations. And so rocks like this, basalt, uh, don't have water, but they have the hydrogen and oxygen in the form of hydroxyl, OH. And okay. so what's curious about rocks like this that are very mm -hmm. old is perhaps now the water is coming from interior of the moon, whereas other measurements of water seem to be more surface, and so we have may have multiple theories of how water is um, on the moon. And then to that same point, Santiago was asking, how old is that rock? It's about three and a half billion years old. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so I actually kind of want to circle back. So you mentioned that, you know, this is the fourth, you know, manned mission that we'd gone on the moon. Like, how much did we actually bring back? Because that's always a question that folks want to know. Yeah, and why it's so rare and why you can buy this at your, you know, local store. Um, with the six, um, with the... Um, 
the human missions to the moon, we brought about 2,000 samples. We're about 800 pounds of, of rocks. And that's it? Like yeah. only? That's all we have. And we have also samples from the three robotic um, Soviet missions from that era as well. But it's a very limited uh, resource. And they're also all from the near side of the moon. We don't have any samples yet from the, the far side of the moon. <laughs> So how, how are we doing on time, Danielle? Because it's like, um, I, I, know, I, I can go crazy on the chat. There's tons of questions coming in. I think we in. have time for about one more question. All right. We'll pick up something. Okay. This is Flats3 is asking Kimberly, what kind of work will astronauts do when we go back to the moon? That's a great question. And... Um, well, um, not only discovering the water and the different mineralogies, um, there is a prospect to, you know, prospect for these um, yeah. elements and these molecules and to use them for a more sustained presence on the moon. Yeah. And also by um, understanding a little bit more about, we still don't know how the moon formed. Um, we have some hypotheses out there, but um, further studies to do a lot of um, excavations in different areas of the moon that we haven't sampled before, like the far side of the moon and the bottoms of permanently shadowed craters, will be ripe for exploration. We have hardly touched the surface on a lot of lunar exploration. Our nearest neighbor has been neglected for too long. <laughs> hey, well... Thank you, Kimberly. As much as we would love to have you hang around for the rest of the show, we do have <laughs> some other presents that Matt is eagerly yes, I'm hoping to Yes, I have more unwrap. gifts coming my way. But since this is like in a short amount of time, this is the second time you're on the show. So I have a feeling we're going to be seeing a lot of Kimberly in the future. Yeah, don't forget, we have a past episode that if you want to learn more about NASA's robotics exploration of the moon, you can go ahead and visit our page that we have set up at uh, nasa.gov backslash Ames uh, backslash NASA and Silicon Valley Live. I think they're also sitting on the on demand. If you they go are. into Twitch, they're all there. You can find that episode. It wasn't too long ago either, it was it? It wasn't. Yeah. So awesome. Well, so cool seeing you. Uh, thanks, Matt Good. and Danielle. Thanks, Kimberly. All right, so she's going to grab that rock. This and who do we have? The rock. The rock. It's precious. It's like, okay. No, it's and it's heavy, too. It's heavy, but it is just, this is such a gem. This is Merry Christmas. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Okay, so up next, we're going to go ahead and bring out John. John, come on down. Dun, 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 dun. Yes, I see, look at more <laughs> gifts coming my way. But first, can we go ahead and shout out John's shirt? Yes, we got to get it. <laughs> Use the camera. <laughs> I'm just trying to be in the Christmas spirit. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. See, see, Dave should have learned from John on sport and the awesome shirt. So, <laughs> right. Don't be shy on the mic, John. Okay, we'll so, move on over there. You know, before we get started, so tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do here at Ames. Okay. Well, I'm Dr. John Jenkins, and I'm a research scientist here at Ames Research Center. I also make my own shirts. This is one that I made. Shut up. Made that, shirt? Yeah, I did, yes. that is awesome. <laughs> yeah, so, as engineers and scientists, you have to be able to design and build things and uh, you can design and build things that you can wear as well so uh, that's very exciting but my day job is to find exoplanets to discover planets around other suns in the neighborhood of the earth okay okay uh, excellent and I mean, Kepler has been you know exoplanets as Danielle already knows <laughs> has been quite been quite the busy topic of late but all right are we going or are we jumping in I, I think Matt go ahead so go. if you guys can't tell Danielle's moving things along and I'm just like anxious to like open this stuff up but another shout out to Melissa art who was saying that wrapping paper exclamation point I think did we have a place where people can go and grab it and download it you know I think we do if you go to our page for the uh, the, the podcast I'm, I'm pretty sure you can download this snazzy wrapping paper so also shout out to the Rex the rest of our comms team who spent <laughs> last night wrapping all of these lovely presents that you have you have here yeah so for the folks in the chat go bug cave on and he will hook you up with that and I gotta be ginger with this because just moving stuff out of the way as I gently bring it out because I'm not supposed Ooh, to shake oh. anything. Oop, and it's got little like spiny things. So take, oh, yeah, great, great shot, Matt. <laughs> Here we go, and as the camera tries to follow, and I'm slowly gonna bring this on over to John. What are folks looking so at here? Right, so this is NASA's first planet hunter. This is the Kepler spacecraft, which was launched in 2009. And 
uh, was up there uh, taking images of stars and looking for instances where the stars would wink at us as a planet crossed in front of the face of the star, causing uh, a drop in brightness, kind of similar to the total eclipse of the sun that happened last year, except that it's uh, uh, a much smaller signal, a, a very weak signal. It's very difficult to detect, which is why we have to launch uh, a spacecraft like this with an exquisitely sensitive photometer. This is a telescope that measures the brightness of over 160,000 stars during the primary mission. And over the course of nine years, the Kepler spacecraft helped discover over 20, about 2,700 planets around other stars. Okay. I go for say, it. So, I'll go, no, no, go for it, Daniel. Well, I was going to say, we have a really cool photo. So nice. if we can get Bill to bring this up, and I'd love to have John, you know, explain to us, like, what are we seeing? Yeah, so, Danielle, right now you're looking at four and a half million stars in this photo. This was the first light image from Kepler. It was snapped uh, a month after we launched. It was our first indication that Kepler actually worked, that everything looked like we could, could do the job and, and complete the mission and find planets. Uh, it's an absolutely gorgeous view of about 1 400th of the sky all at once. So it's about the size of the palm of your hand held at arm's length if you go out and look up at the night sky tonight. And uh, we chose 160,000 stars in this field of view to observe over four years looking for planets. And indeed, we were very successful at that. So that was a question that came up for Dave a while back, but I think this is relevant to Kepler as well. Um, it asked, how can the research community contribute to the space research without having access to resources that NASA does? But And I know, like, scientific community is a big part of what, like, Kepler was doing and, you know, as the mission has recently ended. But still, like, like even now, the scientific community is a huge part of the science. It's still being, like, crunched. Oh, absolutely. So uh, we ignited the fire of the exoplanet community and had over 600 scientists in Europe that actually were very much interested in the stars. So Kepler not only found planets, but also revolutionized the field of asteroseismology. That's the study of star quakes. And it's amazing because if you can measure uh, the oscillations of stars, they kind of are like big bowls of jello that shake and they have star quakes. Uh, they oscillate, they're kind of like bells, so they <laughs> ring like bells, and if you can measure the frequency of the bell, you can determine the size and the mass of it. So, uh, so um, this is amazing. I was gonna say, Omni Slash 79 just ch chimed in with, NASA, how can you determine if the bright dot is a star or a galaxy? Right, so uh, in most cases, you can tell the difference be because galaxies are not point sources, they actually are, are the light is distributed over a, a they're region. Fuzzy, they're fuzzy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're fuzzy. <laughs> Whereas fuzzy stars, is the, the technical term that Matt uses. <laughs> that's right. That's, yes. that's the technical term. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I don't mean. Oh, oh, the other thing is that go uh, on. The question, the question that somebody asked was, how can people contribute to exoplanet mm -hmm. science? And in fact, both with Kepler, but also with NASA's newest mission to find Earth's nearest neighbors, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, which just launched last April, uh, there is a, a Zooniverse project called Planet Hunters. And so okay. citizen scientists can take the data that we've uh, collected from the Kepler spacecraft and now from TESS and uh, help identify planets and other interesting astrophysical phenomena in the light curves. Nice. But well, that was like, I was teasing Danielle earlier because we, we'd put out a video. It's if the folks who are watching on YouTube, it's somewhere in there. I think it's one of the latest videos we put up was an animation where we talked about the star wash and how the scientific community gets that data and cleans it up. I don't know if Capon had, had it lined up for for the chat, but at some point it was he's like crunching and getting all the things. <laughs> folks, if you want it, go demand it from Kayvon if you want that link. Right. And so the star wash actually uh, illustrates one of the biggest uh, contributions that Ames makes to exoplanet science. And that is, not only did Ames manage uh, the flight operations of the Kepler spacecraft and the instrument, but we also processed all the data. So my job was to design and build the, the science pipeline, which is, is the software that we use to crunch all the, all the numbers, all the, all the images that come down from the spacecraft, and to identify the telltale signatures of the planets in that data. And it's a really big job. Uh, and in fact, we use the facility here, the NASA, uh, the mm -hmm. supercomputer, the uh, Plady supercomputer, to do yeah. a lot of the number okay. crunching. So, you know, you brought up tests, and we actually have a really cool animation. So, Bill, can we get that up on screen, please? 
Oh. No, no. I'm hearing no. no's in the, no. in the mics. They are not ready for it. But when they are ready okay. for it, they're going to punch that on up. But in the meantime, in the meantime, <laughs> I'll, I'll, what, a question that came from Delane asks, how does John, how does Kepler make pictures? How does Kepler make pictures? Well, if you're able to stare down the barrel of this telescope, you would be able to see a focal plane that's about a foot across, and it has 42 charged coupled devices. These are called CCDs, mm -hmm. and they're essentially light-sensitive computer chips. In fact, you have one in every one of your cell phones or digi okay. digital camcorders or, or cameras. Yeah. And in, in this case for Kepler, our, our chips are one inches by two inches, so they're much bigger than the CCDs that you have that in your common phone. electronics, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but uh, so essentially, this is a, a digital camera, but with a very large focal plane. And just to give you a sense of the size and scale of this instrument, the backside, the bottom of this telescope, which is the primary mirror back here, is 1.4 meters across, and the aperture here is 0.95 meters. So it's about about 30. It's about a, a, a yard across. So that tells you the size of this telescope, and it's able to make uh, what I consider to be beautiful images of the sky, although from an astronomical perspective, they're not terribly uh, sharp because we're not about making pretty pictures. We're about measuring the brightnesses of the stars so that we can actually measure the small drops in brightness okay. corresponding to when planets cross the face of their star. But the exquisite sensitivity and dynamic range of this instrument allow us to study all kinds of phenomena, not just planets, yeah. not just stars, but also we're able to catch stars in the act of, of going supernova. And, and we're able to study galactic archaeology by doing astro seismology of lots of different kinds of stars, uh, uh, especially during the K2 mission, which was the... Mission the that we version. the second version yeah. of Kepler after we lost uh, two of our reaction wheels. Unfortunately, we had to stop. And there's a uh, the primary mission, and here's uh, where the reaction were? wheels are down here. Um, but we were able to, thanks to a very clever engineer at Ball Aerospace, uh, design a mission whereby we could point the spacecraft in along the line of sight in its orbit and continue the mission. Uh, but instead of observing the Kepler field of view during, that we observed during the primary mission, we observed. Uh, over a dozen fields of view mm -hmm. along the ecliptic as the spacecraft orbited the sun. It's pretty cool. So we have uh, Delano316. We are in the Twitch chat, and we see you. Uh, he, he felt like we, were, we we almost said his name, but didn't quite do it. But yeah, jump on into the chat, send in your questions. Like, in fact, we have one from Electromagnetism is asking, John, why do we see stars as they as they were in the past? How do scientists factor this information in their studies? Right. So everything you look at is happening in the past, even as you talk to somebody across the room from you, mm -hmm. because light travels at a finite speed, although it's mm -hmm. very fast, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the nearest star system to us, uh, the Alpha Centauri system, actually, uh, one of the things we learned from Kepler was uh, that, that there are more planets than there are stars, that planets are ubiquitous. And based on the statistics out of the Kepler mission, we predicted that the nearest Earth-sized planet was probably just around the corner, and, and indeed it turns wow. out that the closest star to the sun, uh, Proxima Centauri, has a, a near-Earth mass planet in a very tight orbit about that star. Uh, so it takes 4.2 years for that light to reach us, and so that means that everything we see there is, is four years in the past. Most of Kepler's targets were 1,000 to 3,000 light years away, so that means that that when you see a transit, it happened 1,000 to 3,000 years ago. Uh, from a science perspective, that's not very important uh, for exoplanets, um, but we do time the transits of the exoplanets because if the timing of the transits mm -hmm. vary, uh, it could be that, this, that the planets are tugging on each other and you can actually use that information, the delays or advances in the timing of the transits to infer the masses of some of these planets, and that's, that's really cool as well. But um, what makes uh, Kepler so successful is that it's opened the door to a lot of other missions yeah. so that, you know, I've worked on Kepler for 23 years, 23, 24, 25 years ago. Uh, this was kind of French Nine science. Of which was when it was in space, but before right, then. Right, right, right. This, this, this was a French concept. It wasn't mainstream. In fact, uh, one of the first astronomical meetings I went to with a poster about Kepler 
Uh, there were no exoplanet sessions. I was put in the miscellaneous poster session right next to a face on Mars poster. <laughs> and so, so that's, where the, that's where the field was 25 years ago. But today we have, we have the Kepler mission, the K2 mission. We have the, the TESS mission. We have James Webb going up in a couple of years. It's going to follow up and characterize uh, the atmospheres of many of the planets that we find. Uh, through the TESS mission. TESS is about finding Earth's closest cousins. Yeah. Most of Kepler planets, we only know the size of the planet. We don't mu know much more about it. With TESS, we're looking at the whole sky. So take Kepler, Kepler's field of view, multiply it by 400. Oh, wow. That's right. so, a lot of so, stars so, and so, a lot of planets. That's right. So the planets are going to be found around stars that are 10 times closer, 100 times brighter. That means we can put lots of telescopes on these new planets that yeah. we're going to find and learn much more about them, including their mass, their density. Once you have the density, you can argue what they're made of. And eventually, we're going to learn what their atmospheres are made of and look for biosignatures, look, look for chemical signatures of, of oxygen, methane, was, carbon dioxide. I was going to uh, say, that, that, that runs into one of the questions from Reptilla, who was asking, eventually you guys will discover life outside Earth. Do you guys think you're close to it, like in the next couple of years? So what's your opinion? Yeah. Well, you can't you be know, wrong. It's, like, it's what do you think, not what is. I, I think it's going to be a race. So the question is, are we going to find uh, signs of life inside our own solar system, perhaps? In the next uh, couple of years. In, next, uh, in the next couple of years or decades, um, as we explore the solar system in these water worlds like mm -hmm. Europa? Yeah. Or are we going to find signs of life in the atmospheres of exoplanets? So these are both yeah. worthy goals. Mm -hmm. NASA is going full bore towards understanding and learning whether there's life extant elsewhere in our own solar system. And we're also proceeding with the technology and with the missions that eventually will allow us to uh, attempt to answer the question, is there life outside of the Earth around these other planets? Okay. So we have a bunch of questions in the chat. Danielle, what are we looking at? Unfortunately, we cannot get to them right now. But <laughs> go for it. But I'm pretty sure we're going to have a future episode where we talk all things Kepler. So you guys will have to go ahead and hold on to those questions at another time. And unfortunately, John, we are going to have to say goodbye. I'm so sorry. Well, that's OK. It's been my pleasure. And Merry Christmas and happy holidays to everybody. You happy well. holidays. All right. What do, who do we have coming up next, Danielle? Uh, we have Eduardo. He's going to go ahead and talk to us about his qu cool area of research. So, Eduardo, go ahead and come on out. Maybe. Excellent. Oh, and he's bringing gifts. Hello. <laughs> How's it going, Eduardo? Good. You? I'm doing awesome. I've been getting presents all day. This is yeah. pretty fun. So, so uh, tell us a little bit about what you do here at Ames. Well, uh, my name is Eduardo Bendik, and I work here at Ames as a research scientist developing new technologies to image exoplanets, to okay. image planets beyond our solar system. So basically, it's complementing what John yes, exactly. was explaining about Kepler. Almost like we planned that transition. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so do, you want, do we jump into it? Go ahead. Bro. All right, all right, all right. So. This is all right. Let's see. Let's see what Eduardo has brought for us. I can, let's see if you like it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, here we go. All right. I, I, yeah, I don't know. Eduardo's probably freaking out. Like, don't yeah. spin it around too many times, bro. No shaking. Don't yeah. shake. No shaking. Okay. And what we have here, and I will hand this over to you. Wow, and it's oh, that's got some weight to it. Yeah. Okay, so looky, looky, what do we got here? There you go. So what we have here is the critical part of a coronagraph. A coronagraph okay. is the new technology that will allow us to see planets around other stars. That will allow us to separate the light of the star from the light of the planet. Okay, and uh, you know, the coolest, I, I know you have an awesome trick with this camera where you line it up perfectly with your eye. Cause I, <laughs> yeah, you wanna see? <laughs> yeah, let's go do that, let's go do that. And we have, okay. <laughs> Jesse and Mark are gonna try to line this on up. So if I aim to the camera, probably mm -hmm. you'll see my eye there yeah. getting deformed. And that's because uh, the system, the optical system, focuses the light 
mm-hmm. focuses the light of the star on a very small point to be able to separate it from the planet. So is that similar to like a telescope or well, what's going on there? The telescope comes before. So the first element is a telescope. Okay. That's the one that captures the light. Okay. And then funnels the light into this optical train and these special optics that separate the light. Because imagine it comes a star and the planet is very close to a star. When, when we see Kepler images, mm-hmm. you see just a star, but uh, there is a star, there are more planets, there are a bunch of things that in the case of Kepler, they're all in one pixel or multiple fuzzy pixels, as you said before. <laughs> uh, in the case of uh, on this technology, we zoom in into that pixel and separate that into two different um, elements. So, so that's the way that this works. Okay. So, one question that you know sometimes comes up, like, why are we imaging versus detecting? Um, well, the first step is detect, and what Kepler has done yeah. is detect mm-hmm. many planets. Now we know that the planets are there. We know the demographics. That means we know how many, how they are, how many big, how many small, all kind of uh, information about the planet population. Now, imaging is the next step in which we know the most interesting ones and we go after them. And that's not just like, okay, there's a dip in the light, we know it's there. You're talking about you actually want to take a picture of the exoplanet. Correct. It's actually get reflected light from the planet. Yeah. So it's not an indirect. This is direct imaging. Yeah. And the beauty of that is that then you can see the color. Okay. Okay. By watching the color, for example, if you look at the Earth from the moon, it looks bluish. If you look to Mars, it looks orange. Yeah. And those colors tell us something about the planet, but it's a lot of information where we can learn. We can learn what kind of chemicals are in the atmosphere, what kind of weather, rotation period, a lot of information. From. And, you know, speaking of images, we actually have one. <laughs> you guys, can, Bill, can we get that brought up? Oh, yeah, look at that. So what's what's going on here? Well, that's, that's one of the few images of exoplanets. It's a real image of a star called HR 8799 that is around 120 light, 29 light years away. So it's fairly close for our galaxy standards, but it's uh, very far from our human everyday scale. And what you see there is a star that is blocked. You cannot see a star anymore. And the white circle shows three planets around that star. So this is a planetary system. It's a solar system with three planets around. Mm-hmm. This image was taken on the, uh, by the Suero telescope in Hawaii, mm-hmm. in which they were using uh, a very similar technology to this one. So uh, this technology that we have here at NASA is also implemented on ground-based telescopes to be able to image stars. But if you look at in, in the image, there are a lot of grains and noise that's caused by the atmosphere. You see that grains, grainy mm-hmm. everywhere, that's the turbulence on the atmosphere. So the, the goal that we have here is to take the same technology, bring it to space. And then from space, re, you don't have the atmosphere. Okay. So we have a question that came in. Is, I'd like to ask if there's anything we're looking for specifically with, Im- with the imaging, or rather taking the pictures first, then deciphering what is there. That is from the Senate, a.k.a. Emperor Palpatine, because he <laughs> is the Senate. So. Well, that's an excellent question. That's uh, a big problem in this kind of missions, which is strategize how you spend the time. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. you can allocate a very little time just to do detection, or you can spend more time trying to... Uh, recognize the different colors and assess the chemical composition of the atmosphere. So there is a very big trade-off between surveying many stars and do kind of a blind search Mm -hmm. or a targeted search of a target that we already know and focus there and learn as much as possible. So normally there is a a priori strategy, but then as the mission goes on, you can adapt that depending on the value of the target that we find. Okay, I'm looking at, there's a whole bunch of questions that are coming in. We have, that's awesome, from RJ the Noob. And we also have, how long until we can image moons and other satellites of exoplanets? That's from S. Quudge. Well, that's or another Squudge. great question. Actually, imaging moons sometimes is not that difficult as it seems, because moons tend to be hotter than the planet during the formation process. So the planet forms, and then the moon around is still solidifying and could be as like as a lava ball, and then mm-hmm. emits light on infrared wavelengths. So it is possible to see moons on their formation process. 
<laughs> and then a shout out over, over to our friend Delano316. Uh, I'm reading some of the questions that are on a slight delay because uh, Kayvon's sending them on over to me. So if we don't get them in real time, we're getting some of the older questions as they come on through. But Danielle, keep going. Well, I say uh, X Arrows says that it looks, the image sort of looks like a lunar eclipse. Well, that's exactly what it is. A lunar eclipse is the process in which the moon goes in front of the sun. Mm -hmm. And because of the distances and their sizes, it happened to be angular the same. So they look like the same size, but they are very different. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what this device does is a device to miniaturize an eclipse. Basically, we compress the light and we have a tiny blocker that uh, blocks the light of the star. So it's like having an eclipse, but since you don't have a moon that you can move around, we do it on a microscopic way inside this device that I mm -hmm. can bring as a gift for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll nice. have to take it with me. You're just going to take it with me. Yeah. So um, we have a whole bunch of questions coming in. This is from uh, Oprah uh, underscore FT Winfrey, which I assume is the real Oprah, of which course. should be bringing us gifts because I think that's kind of how that works. <laughs> but um, Oprah is asking us, how do exoplanet hunters know which stars to look at? There are so many to choose from in the Milky Way. Where do you even start? Well, um, there's where we complement uh, with ground-based observatories, a Kepler mission, and other missions. There are some indications of uh, presence of planets that have been uh, um, concluded by Kepler and ground-based observatories. And the goal is that then when we have the best clues that there is a very high-value target, we go with this more mm -hmm. focused mission and stay there and stare. So it's a strategy that... Uh, uh, uses the a priori knowledge of other astronomical community instruments. Okay, so Matt, I think we have time for one more question. One more. Okay, let me. I'm gonna go with Omni slash seventy nine, who asks, "How close uh, did the planet have to be from the star, along with its size, for the camera to pick up the planet?" <laughs> that's that's a real key parameter here. Uh, if the planet is too close to a star, then you cannot separate it because the light of the star overwhelms the planet. So this device helps to separate, but it's not perfect. Um, normally, uh, the shape of the optics that we design here, all the surface, uh, op the optical surfaces that you hear, see here, though that shape defines mm -hmm. how close you can get the planet. But as you design the system to be able to image planets that are closer and closer, it gets more sensitive to any error on the pointing on how you're aiming to a star. Okay. So if you make it very, very precise, then any shaking of the spacecraft will ruin the process. So th there is a trade-off of how close you can uh, image. Now, for this, this device is designed to be able to see a planet like the Earth around a sun-like star at 10 parsecs. So basically, if we look at a nearby star, yeah. then and there is a planet in the habitable zone where, like, similar to the orbit of the Earth, we'll be able to see it with this device. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, you mentioned Parsec, and I was going to throw out that, you know, know, cheesy yeah. Star Wars joke. You but, have to you have know. a Star Wars joke. <laughs> um, the Senate requires it, obviously. So, so thank you so much so for coming. This has been coming. fun. You're very welcome. <laughs> All right. So what are we looking at next, Danielle? Well, I do need to do a little housekeeping. So as a reminder, this is uh, you're watching NASA in Silicon Valley Live. And if you have a question for our, our guest, definitely write it in the chat. And so let's go ahead and bring out Zahir. Zahir, come on down. Hey, hey how's it going? How hey, we're good. Have a seat and get on up on that mic. So, so uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and some of the research that you do here at Ames. So I'm a scientist with the SOFIA program. Uh, I used to actually be based out of Palmdale, uh, oh, nice. where I took care of the science instruments. That's kind of the cameras that we mount to uh, what we're going to open here. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, these days, no spoilers. Uh, no, no, <laughs> no, no spoilers. Okay. Gotta build the tension, right? <laughs> uh, these days, I'm helping make sure that the software is right for our program. Okay, so before we, you know, move a little further, so what is Sophia? Because you know, everything ah. in the government has an acronym. Sophia is not just a name; it's a <laughs> fancy acronym. That's right. It, it, it's all in the name. Uh, yes. It tells <laughs> you what it is. It's the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. Which I like to affectionately refer to it as it's a telescope on a plane. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's the largest telescope on a plane in the world. 
Uh, we fly at night to look at the stars. And it flies out of Palmdale, mm -hmm. where the operations center is, uh, with Armstrong. And, in Southern uh, California. In Southern California. Mm -hmm. The science center is here at Ames. And so here we have uh, the science team that looks at all the data that comes in, uh, sorts it out, does uh, reduction uh, pipeline stuff, and then sends it out to the community to do work on it in the community sense, where a lot of the science questions are answered. Okay, so Matt, let's go ahead so and we're open do up. This thing? Let's open up this gift that was brought along. All right, all right. And I, and I know the general rule is like, don't shake it. <laughs> And let's get this awesome wrapping paper out of the way. As then I try to undo this box, which is slightly, there we go. Just Oops. Rip it. Just I am just gonna rip this thing off because for whatever reason it's stuck. Oh, take a look at this. <laughs> and then here we go for the unboxing. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> So, guys, this is Sophia. It right. is the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. You got to get on that side because that's where it is. I'm turning this towards you is because over here you see our telescope. Uh, yeah. It's about two meters. There we go. About, Let's tilt that down a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Yeah. It's about two meters, uh, um, 2.5 meters, sorry, in diameter, uh, about twice as tall as, as a person. Um, wow. And it is. Uh, aluminum coated and what we do is we fly it at night and look at the stars kind of in this way. Um, why do we fly uh, a telescope? Uh, it's because to do infrared astronomy we need to get through the, in, uh, the water vapor that hugs close to the earth. Okay, so speaking of that, I, Bill, I think we have a really cool clip that talks a little bit about what you're hey. describing. There so she is. So yeah, what's what, going what are we on seeing here? here? So you're seeing Sophia in flight. There's the telescope opening, uh, or rather, rather the door. The telescope's inside there, uh, probably taken from uh, one of the F-18 chase planes. And this is what we do in flight. Uh, it, the telescope op opens up. It's kind of like a big garage door. You can see there's actually an ap aperture that tracks with the telescope as it moves up and down. And to point the telescope, you can move the telescope, what's called azimuthally, up and down, but then to uh, look in a different direction, you actually have to turn the plane. So our flight plans are pretty interesting. Wow. So I'm here up. she is probably, uh, well, it's hard to tell if that's sunset or sunrise coming in, um, but uh, it's quite, quite an uh, operation um, to be flying a telescope. So have you ever gotten to fly on yes. one of these Yes, missions? I've gotten to fly several times. Um, it is really spectacular uh, to be in near space conditions. Uh, mm -hmm. And what's really amazing is that, keep in mind, that telescope, that's open to 45,000 feet. And then in the cabin, we're, I'm sitting there in a coat just that's like right. I am now. <laughs> Not in this actual plane for ants. No. This is, <laughs> no. this is like digital donger and other folks are saying, what is that, a plane for ants? <laughs> so, but I'd imagine like you're riding in that thing. The turbulence, how does that affect when you open that door? Or how, how does does so it it's, matter? Or, yeah. It's a testament to the engineers that designed this. It's kind of hard to see on this model, but... Actually, the wind stream comes this way. There's a kick out here and then a, and then a matched slope in the back. And there's actually a baffling inside that keeps what is called a Venturi effect from happening. That's kind of this uh, effect that would happen when you have air going this way. Uh, it would feel like there's uh, a pressure orthogonal to it. Think of um, the effect of wind going uh, against uh, two buildings that are really close together. When you stand between buildings, you get a rush of air with wind going across the other way. That's what would happen here. But the engineering is so good that when we opened the door for the first time, uh, they actually had to call to the chase plane and say, hey, is the door open? Really? Because they... <laughs> Pilots could not feel it on the stick. They had an indicator in the cockpit that it was open, but they wanted to confirm. So one of the questions that comes from Digital Don uh, Dondry wants to know, does the telescope need any stabilization? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, there is actually a very special uh, type of engineering around that stabilization. So for takeoff and landing, we actually lock the telescope in a specific way to safe it. 
uh, against the uh, impact of a landing um, and the rumble of a takeoff. And th that is a bladder on bladder, uh, rubber bladder on bladder, that is very similar to air ride trucking technology. Really? So that's oh, wow. for takeoff and landing. We call it caging the telescope. Okay. Now in flight, the telescope is actually suspended. Um, half the telescope is in the cabin, half the telescope is in what we call the telescope cavity, the back area that's open to 45,000 feet. Uh, there's a, the fulcrum on which it rests is actually a spherical bearing, kind of like a gimbal. Uh, and that bearing is on pressurized oil that is as thin as a human hair. Uh, but when, what we do is we balance the telescope so perfectly, and I've literally done this, that I've moved 17 tons with my pinky because there's no moment of inertia. You can just move it around on that bearing. It's spectacular. Well, and that isolates it from the turbulence. So the, t the aircraft is doing this, mm -hmm. and the telescope the aircraft is moving around the bearing, and the telescope is locked onto a star. So uh, we cool. have Antiparticle73 was asking about images captured by Sophie. But I also want to add on top of um, Rage Jordan asks that can Sophia see black holes? Because I know like when you're looking at things in the infrared, it's different from your visual light. So right. are black holes in the, in the game? Is that stuff that you're looking at? So we actually have a very famous image looking at the center of the galaxy. Uh, that I urge people to look up, uh, where we look at the matter that's being sucked in and therefore push it, putting off a lot of light into a black hole. But the black hole is not able to be imaged. That's why it's a black hole. You see everything around it. Information <laughs> yes, is yeah. not leaving. Light is not escaping the black hole. Uh, it's hence not the reflecting name. any light for us <laughs> No, not exactly. And then nothing's coming out. But what you actually can see, uh, if you go look this image up on the Sophia webpage, is you see um, this beautiful um, corona uh, around where the, at the very center of that image the black hole would be. And that, is, um, that was a very impor important science result because it was basically an independent confirmation of a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy. So this is actually a really good question that just popped up in the chat is from President underscore Donald underscore Trump asks NASA, why use a plane when we have satellites and what are the benefits of using a plane? So, yeah, let's talk about this. We have there are space telescopes that we learned mm -hmm. from Kepler. We have satellites that circle the Earth. So and then there's land based telescopes. So talk about that unique world where a telescope on a plane is is critical. That's that's a great question. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, <laughs> so Sophia bridges a gap between ground-based telescopes uh, and satellites. So when we get above uh, the w water vapor, we're seeing 99.99% transmission in infrared. On the top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii, mm -hmm. which is where there are several amazing infrared observatories, and un uh, well, uh, uh, an, uh, an infrared observatory and other observatories, you get about 25% transmission. So you're still in the soup, as it were, mm -hmm. when you're even on top of a mountain. When you get Sophia, you get to near space. I'm going to say, you're going to want to keep the mic yeah. up on the mic. Yeah. I, I can imagine Eric, our audio guy, is going nuts. Oh, thank you so much, Matt. <laughs> so, <laughs> so go ahead. <laughs> so, so, what act, so what Sophia does is it gives you an ability to have near satellite quality, but it comes home every night. So we actually have had a suite of seven different types of instruments yeah, or cameras, turn yeah. with you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, different types <laughs> of cameras that um, have, we've been able to field at different times. When you launch a satellite, that's all you got. And that lasts a certain amount of time and then it's done. Whereas Sophia can fly for 25 or 30 years, train a lot of scientists, train a lot of graduate students, uh, help develop technology by testing it in Sophia, where there's a lot less risk because it comes mm -hmm. home every night. If that camera breaks, you've got six more that you can change out to. I was going to say, that's okay. also a unique thing. Normally, like when you send Hubble, I mean, mm -hmm. though they did service Hubble, but like well, that not took a new, spacewalk. That took yeah. a spacewalk. It's not exactly easy to do, but but these space telescopes, like you can change out those instruments. Technology improves. Routinely. You come up with new. Awesome. We're actually on our third generation instrument that's being developed now. Uh, recently, we've uh, finally uh, hit our stride with the Hawk instrument, which was our second generation and is producing absolutely amazing science that's really uh, revolutionizing things. Uh, in fact, uh, it, the AAS in January, we've got some mm -hmm. featured presentations that are going to be uh, groundbreaking. All right. I can't. No I won't no, 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 no. We have nothing to announce at this time. But, but then, but then there will be things. After that, then we'll, we'll have lots, and we'll have you back on. 
That'd and we'll, we'll and we'll talk more about that stuff. How are we doing on time, Danielle? We do have to move on. So I just want to say thank you, Zahir. Thank you guys for and having me. it if you guys want to learn more about the world's largest flying observatory, you can check out our past episode about Sophia and the history of airborne astronomy. Awesome. Thanks thank for coming. Thank you guys man. very much. Awesome. All right, we got more gifts coming, right? We do. See ya. So let's go ahead and bring out Yael. Yael. We need some intro music <laughs> over here as we as we, we bring gotta, people we in. It get feels them empty. To be here. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Good. I'm kind of sad that you didn't have the prices right. Oh, I know. You did it before. That was good. I had, I, I like sang it out. Yeah. <laughs> so first things first, a uh, welcome. And if you guys want to, if you want to tell our viewers like a little bit about what you do here. Yeah. So I'm a support scientist here at Ames, and I work with the space biology and space biosciences, helping other people do space biosciences research. That's pretty cool. So are you the one that's actually doing the science? Nope. I know. Yeah, what's the difference between a support scientist and a research scientist? Right. So there's a lot of different things that go on behind the scenes to <laughs> yes. do research. There's actual work in the lab. And then there's also like, you know, getting the grants and then there's administering everything. And then uh, a lot of what we do here at Ames also is helping experiments actually get to the space station. So and I help the people who do all those things. Plus a little bit of outreach, like that's oh, pretty cool. Coming on here, awesome. so are, are we about Matt, time? We're ready to do this. Let's, let's, <laughs> this is another one where I'm not allowed to shake it too let's much, but we've got some cool stuff over here. So, oh wow! Oh. So you know, some people get puppies or kittens for Christmas. <laughs> Not, at, Not NASA. at NASA. We're getting a little something else. I'm going to hand this on over to you because so that Mark and Jesse can get in on that shot yeah. as close as they can. Don't, don't be shy with that zoom. Oh, yeah, there we go. Oh, look at that. So... What are those things that are what flying? What are we looking at here? So these are fruit flies. They're totally ordinary <laughs> fruit flies, like you get around your compost bin or fruit in your house. <laughs> uh, and they're model organisms for research, which means that which means that a lot of scientists around the world use them to do their research. Now I see we're still, oh, here we go. Yeah, look at that <laughs> shot. Yeah, can you see those flies? Maybe if I move these guys out of the way. Yeah, there's a oh, whole no. bunch of flies in there. Um, so, yeah, so uh, scientists at Ames have sent fruit flies to the space station on numerous occasions, and it turns out, um, I was told yesterday that fruit flies were one of the first organisms that actually ever went to space. Interesting. They've nice. been They've been space adventurers since the 40s. Ooh. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, so... So <laughs> maybe talk a little bit about, I mean, these fruit flies, Not maybe not these ones specifically, but I'm sure they're cousins, like, <laughs> have been to the space station. So talk a little bit about that. What? Are, yeah, so maybe these guys is like great, 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 great aunt or something <laughs> Yes, <laughs> went to the space station. Uh, yeah, so lots of different experiments have uh, taken fruit flies to the space station and They've looked at things like what happens to their hearts when they're in space? What happens to their immune system? Mm -hmm. Do they get infected by bacteria uh, more easily after they've been in space? Um, and the reason that fruit flies are used for that kind of research is that they actually have a lot in common with people. And mm -hmm. for instance, 77% of the disease genes in humans also really? have analogs in flies. So that means that uh, flies have really similar genes to us. And then we can use flies to figure out um, what are the risks to astronauts if they spend a lot of time in space. So, like, flies have really short life cycles. It only takes them, you mm -hmm. know, they live for, like, a month and a half or something like that. So we can see their, what happens to a fly that spends its entire life in space and how does that affect it. Because it's a lot harder to do that with a human astronaut. So th that's a question that I have. What does happen yeah. to a, a fly in space, in zero gravity? How does it affect it? What is, how is it different? Yeah, so it's the, I mean, similar to um, what happens to human astronauts, like their immune systems don't work as well. There are changes to how their heart works. They don't have any bones, so we can't study bones in flies, but... Uh, do they even fly if they don't have to? Do they yeah, float? Or I've, how does seen, it... I've seen a video of it. It's funny. They kind of like, they can they move their wings and they kind of like drift around and, <laughs> and then kind of try to grab onto the wall. Like it doesn't oh. work as well. 
<laughs> well, it was like they use the wing almost as like, I don't know, it's just like some vibration to like create momentum to move around. Yeah, I don't know. Still, it's they weird. They still have air for their wings to push against. Okay, so. I guess, yeah. Uh, but it's confusing, I guess, and, and they kind of tend to bounce off the walls. It's so, like it doesn't work as well. Well, and there's a couple questions. Is, is that yellow stuff in there? Is that stuff that they're eating or what is in this in yeah, these vials? that's their food. Um, it's made out of like yeast and sugar and uh, cornmeal. Um, and there's enough food in there for them to live for like a month. And they'll also lay their eggs in there and their mm -hmm. babies will grow in it. So it's like a fly uh, a cafeteria, fly and community. Nursery. <laughs> Everything they need is in there. Yeah. <laughs> so, how long do these missions last aboard the ISS? So usually they last for about a month. Uh, a lot of the missions, like, will go up on one spacecraft, stuff will happen for a month, then they'll come back down so that um, the researchers can see what happened. Uh, after they were in space, which is really neat to actually be able to get samples back from space as well. Mm -hmm. So are we talking multiple generations, one generation, like you got like your great, great, great? Definitely, yeah. So for flies, I think that usually they get back around three generations of flies. I mean, if they left them up longer than you would get, mm -hmm. they would just keep breeding in there. Eventually they would need new food, but... Yeah. We have a ton of questions. So it's like one is this is from Rasonic. Uh, what's your favorite project you've helped work on and that has made it to the space station? So I myself have not worked on uh, any single project. I'm okay. kind of more at the program level helping all of the projects. Yeah, yeah. But, a little bit of everything. Uh, yeah. So you get to take credit for several things. <laughs> oh, I everything. That is all of them that you've <laughs> all touched. All the things. You yeah. do all the things. I all the things. Um, lots Your of boss hats. is listening. You I know. Pay I know. more money. <laughs> <laughs> get this woman a raise. It's a good One thing that I think is cool is that there's going to be an experiment coming up. I think in 2019 with tardigrades and I mean you can't not like tardigrades they're little crazy creatures with claws and they're microscopic and they like survive radiation and they can survive the vacuum of space so they're really neat I like them personally interesting so, Omnislash <laughs> has a question how many ge generations would it take for the flies um, the flies take to evolve to get used to low gravity uh, I don't know um, I'm not sure that an experiment has been done on that yet but Fruit flies are used for a lot of genetics and evolution research. So if, you know, if we could get funding to do that, then we could just try it out. One of our, our reoccurring uh, guests, this is Space TV Net. Have more fruit flies gone to space than any other creature? And I'm actually going to tag on yes, to that. So, like, what other things have flown? Oh, yeah, lots of organisms. So from from Ames specifically, we we have flown um, mice and yeast. Uh, like plants <laughs> and then there's also been lots of organisms in space in general not just from Ames I mean there's also been squid uh, what else <laughs> I mean, it just it's ridiculous the list of organisms that have been up there I think it's spiders um, birds yeah interesting <laughs> it's more like what has not been so up there. How are we doing on time? We have a ton of questions, but uh, I know I have another thing I want to hit up. We have time for like one more question oh, boo. before we do have to move on. Well, there was one thing that I did want to show off, and this was something oh, that yeah. I <laughs> caught in, and I'm going to hand this over to Yael, mm -hmm. to Yael, and like let's zoom in on that. Look at Mark and uh, Jesse will get a good shot on this. Look at that. That's cute. It, it, it's like some yeast Christmas art. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about what, what we're looking at here and what, what, what's the story behind this? So yeast is a like a uh, important organism for an upcoming mission at Ames called BioSentinel. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to send yeast into deep space. It's going to be the first time there's a organism in deep space outside of low Earth orbit since Apollo times. Yeah. This is so not the space station. It's going no, out. No, it's going, it's going to orbit the sun on its own in its own little small set. It's pretty cool. Um, and yeast are awesome because they're eukaryotes like humans and they've got complicated cells, uh, but they're single-celled organisms, so we can stick them in a satellite and mm -hmm. see how they can deal with that radiation. Uh, but they're, you know, you can also make art with them. Nice. <laughs> That's pretty well, cool. And I'll say, Kayvon is going to throw a link over into the chat because mm -hmm. there's this is just 
like just the surface of some of the different uh, yeast art that folks had pulled together, some <laughs> holiday themed ones that I think um, if people remember Abby, one of our co-hosts has uh, helped throw together a story with the IL. Um, so I don't know. He'll throw that in there so you guys can check out some of the cool holiday art that they pulled together um, okay. for the name of science. Of course. Of course. Science. <laughs> so. We, uh, we actually, since we pulled out this yes. cool yeast art, we're going to have to move on and say goodbye. <laughs> but if you guys want to learn more about some of our life science research uh, aboard the International Space Station, you can check out our Genius Space Hacks episode. And you go ahead and visit na nasa.gov backslash Ames backslash NASA in Silicon Valley Live. All right. So as Yael <laughs> makes her way out, who do we have up on deck? Uh, we have a researcher by the name of Robin, and she's also oh. around here. We call her the queen <laughs> of keeping spacecraft cool. Nice. <laughs> hey, welcome back, Robin. <laughs> so if folks who don't remember, or if you haven't seen the other episode, yeah, her, Robin was just here. She was, just a few weeks ago. Yes, yeah. we talked about like heat shields, so it might be a little bit of a teaser of what is in this box. But okay, Ooh, nice. She's bringing out the oh, gloves. She's busting out the gloves. Yep. So Matt, please so be, in there. be gentle. We're be gonna careful. do this one. No right, shaking. Right, here we go. <laughs> and then just rip this on open. And you know it. You know it's you up know there. You know it's a good present. When it you comes stand in up. a special like <laughs> yes, it has its in a special box. Each piece. Oh, it's all taped to it. And the gift giver is wearing gloves. There you go. Yeah, really. <laughs> Okay, I got the top that's coming off over here. All right, let's do this. This is the unboxing. Ooh. All right. Ta -da. Pull it off. There you go. Going to keep the lid close by. Right. Okay. So eat, this is actually a tile that um, could have flown on the spacecraft that um, go to, took go for curiosity. It. Don't be shy to Mars. So Ooh. this is a shoulder tile and it is installed this way. So it comes up and over and we get the the highest heating is right at that intersection okay, there. So I actually think we have a really cool photo. So you Bill, do? can we get that brought up on sp on screen? Oh, can you oh, see nice. it? No, okay. So actually yeah. Um, I had outlined one of these. There it is. Oh, there you go. Magical. <laughs> there it is. That's the size of this tile. So this is one tile out of 32 or 33 that go around that circumference there. So you can see that, I mean, that's a full-size man standing underneath there. It is a four and a half meter diameter spacecraft. So it's pretty big. And so we have... Um, 30 or so, 32 of these going around, and um, many, many more tiles. Each tile has its own custom made and Ooh, designed nice. uh, foam box that it gets <laughs> shipped in to protect it so that when it gets to, the, to be installed, it mm -hmm. gets their hole. It's a very fragile and um, brittle material, so we need to so protect it. So what is it made out of? It, this is Pika. We had talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> so Mr. Heat Sh or Mr. Heat Shield Girl is is oh, the back yeah. shell, also made of Pika. So I fully expect a lot of Pikachu uh, emotes. <laughs> the back shell is not made out of Pika. the The forward heat shield is all protected with Pika, and Pika is phenolic impregnated carbon ablator, <laughs> and so um, it will handle very high heating. Um, I went back after we had practiced, <laughs> we had rehearsed, and I looked up, and so Pika can handle heating up to about, or even higher than, 1,000 watts per square centimeter. And when you stand outside in the sun, you get about 0.15 watts per square centimeter of heating on your body. <laughs> you so this is 10,000 <laughs> times as high. This material can take 10,000 times that heating. So uh, <laughs> there's tons of Pikachu emotes, oh, as no. I expected. <laughs> um, but one of the questions is coming, this is from Lord Inter, is asking, could you avoid re-entry heat by just decelerating more? Um, it would reduce it, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Then you have to carry all of that fuel. 
Oh, yeah. That's yeah. the problem. And you know, we have a lot of scenarios where we look, especially for the heavy, heavy mass, we do a direct entry, right? Mm-hmm. We travel. I'm going to set this back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put okay. it right there. We travel and um, we are in cruise. We are coming close and we release, right? And we mm-hmm. enter right away. So, but there's also uh, scenarios where we arrow capture, where we just skim the atmosphere to slow down and to go into orbit. And so we get heating then, not as high as entry heating that we we do direct. So then we we circle and go into orbit. And then from orbit and entry, it's a much lower heating. Okay. Okay. But... But the heavier we get, the higher the heat. You know, the bigger yeah. we get, the higher the heating and the speeds and and volumes and area and everything else. So we have um, issues with how we how we land big things. So RJ the noob is asking, why do they make the heat shields up of many small tiles? Well, that's a really good question, and that is because of how the material is made. This material, this was cut out of a billet. There were mm-hmm. actually six of these cut out of a single billet. Um, the billets come, uh, they are about 42 inches long by mm-hmm. 22 inches wide. These come out of an 8-inch billet because they are cut this way out of the billet. Okay. So they can, they can set six out of, in the billet and they cut those out. Um, we have limitations on the direction and the angle such that we want to have the best properties. Those billets are, you know, big fat blocks like Mm -hmm. like this solid, but the best direction, the lowest heating or lowest conductivity is through the thickness. So if we're cutting a curved piece out of it, we're limited also on the size of how far off of the normal that we can go. Um, to keep low conductivity. Now we have the new materials we had talked about where mm-hmm. I showed the felt, mm-hmm. where first of all we can make much bigger tiles because we can shape them mm-hmm. such that the low conductivity is the, the conductivity is the same everywhere. And then we also that the broad goods come in the felt comes like like cloth almost. It comes up to 60 inches wide yeah. and very, very long rolls. You know, so you can make bigger pieces. There, our limitation is our processing facilities. Where can okay. we do that mm-hmm. and make bigger and bigger pieces? These are this tile is um, among the smallest. The next tile up, those two rows have the most tiles around, mm-hmm. and they are the smallest tiles. Um, further up, we have we Bigger. have larger tiles, okay. right? Probably harder to bring on set. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I don't have one hanging around. Yes. And this one has some special features that we have just recently come across, and that's the the lovely tiger stripe. Um, I'm all for it. I think it'll be pretty. Okay. If we fly it on Mars 2020. So this but... one could potentially end up on Mars 2020. Or this one won't. Not the, this the, specific the, the, one. Its neighbors will. Yes, okay. yes its neighbors are. Um, we took these two out of production. We took two tiles out of production because we were looking at these dark marks mm-hmm. and wanting to know, could this still fly? Is yeah. there a problem with the material? Mm-hmm. And we did all kinds of testing. We did arc jet testing, which you saw, yeah. um, what that's like. Um, we did properties testing. We did everything and have shown that the material... The black, the dark material behaves just like the light material, which so, is good. So we can fly it. So Ken Obe is saying, "Why is the material so fragile?" Also, Robin's grandson Bradley is yelling, "Hi, Nona! I love you!" <laughs> Hi, Bradley! <laughs> <laughs> and everybody in, in, in the room next door immediately went, "Aww!" <laughs> yes, he's about twenty months old and. Cute as a button. So, no, no, anyway, tell, tell us about why it's so fragile. Um, it is a very brittle material. Um, it it doesn't bend. It doesn't stretch at all. And so it's very sensitive to what we put it on. So the, the great thing about the missions that we've flown is we've flown this material on Stardust, and we it is flying right now on Osiris Rex and that's okay. those two were single pieces because they're about this big less than a meter in diameter um, a single piece of pica um, for Mars for MSL so for the spacecraft that took curiosity and for Mars 2020 which will take the next rover 
um, we're doing it, we have to do it in tiles. But all of those missions, they get to, they're bonded onto a composite that have similar okay. expansion properties okay. when you get it warm, which is good. If we had to put this on metal, then we might have to use tr strain isolation pads. Okay. As we go to the, the more flexible uh, substrate, we have a little more flexibility in <laughs> uh, what we can bond to because it has Clever. higher strain to failure. If you pull this, it goes and breaks into two pieces. If you pull some of the other materials, they kind of stretch and, and they don't break. You don't get chunks falling off. So we have a ton of questions coming oh, in. So we, we can do. just oh. keep going through this. Okay. One, This is from a while back, but it was Space TV that asked, um, is the Pika material similar to what's used to protect the Parker Solar Probe? No. Completely different. No. Parker Solar Probe is carbon-carbon. Uh, it is very, very dense. It's a carbon... Um, carbon cloth mixture that, that's filled with carbon. It's very dense, very um, high conductivity, but then that's placed over a carbon foam to try to insulate it. Okay. okay. But Does, yeah, they, this could not handle the heating that the, well, the and, and that, solar probe will see. That was another question that came through. I'm going to see who asked that. Okay, this is um, Tote Zire is asking, does it insulate as well as provide heat resistance? So I'm yes. guessing, yeah, as it burns yes. up is also... Yes, it, because of the phenolic, it, it's a very... And the low density, it's a very nice insulator, but it also can handle very high heating on the surface. So you get high temperatures at the surface, but at the, at the interface, it stays cool. So it's kind of the people have talked about, mm -hmm. we used to be able to have a torch and show a, sh a shuttle tile and hold yeah. it and, mm -hmm. well, no fire here. <laughs> but um, nice. this is even better in okay. that regard, in that the way that the phenolic works, it will um, protect the material. All right, okay. Danielle, how are we on time? I would love to sit and talk with you all day, Robin, about all things Heat Shield. But unfortunately, we do have to say goodbye. All right. But for our, a... user, our viewers at home, if you want to learn more about Robin's research, you can check out our past episode about the science here. of heat shields. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much, Thank Robin. Yeah. Nice Thanks, seeing Robin. you again. Oh, I know. I'll give you an elbow <laughs> over here. As you're... Fine. No shape. <laughs> exactly. As Dirty as the Pika. Oh, see, look at it. <laughs> it's all a part of the holidays. You have to well, clean up thank afterwards. Thank you, Robin. Uh, so let's go ahead and bring up our next guest, Don. So, Don, why don't you Don, go ahead and come on out? on out? Make it on out over here. All yeah, right. Your present. Yes. I, hey, it yes. is my lucky day today. I'm getting nothing but presents. So while Matt is going ahead and opening up his presents, so why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do here at Ames? Okay. Well, I'm an aerospace engineer at Ames, and I have done a lot of wind tunnel testing of advanced aircraft concepts. Okay. So you mentioned wind tunnel. Like, what is a wind tunnel? Wind tunnel. It's very cool. <laughs> it's basically a large tube, and we pump air through there, sometimes at very high speeds. Okay. Um, there are large tunnels that can take a full-size airplane, like a 737, can actually fit in our largest wind tunnel. And we've put fighter airplanes in there. Nice. Uh, there are also smaller wind tunnels that are used when we need to go to higher speeds in the tunnel. And then we put in a scale model in the wind tunnel. Okay, right, so, so I'm guessing I'm since jump on in. Yes. involved in that, it may be uh, it her presence. I was going to say, it is, I was gonna say, is Don our last guest? He is no. not. He's not. We still have more people coming on now. So look at this. Be gentle. I am very gentle. I think you can. Ready, and right. here we go. It might be upside down, is it? No, we're good. Okay. Here we go. Oh, there we go. Because I don't want to mess it. I don't want to mess right. it up. That's I want right. to like be very, very well, this is gentle with it. Model. There we go. There's oh, a it was to protect upside down. It because it's there delicate. you go. Okay. It looks all... Oh, ooh, that is so a cool. fancy toy right yes. here. Yes, sharp edges and everything. <laughs> a lot of pokey <laughs> so, things. So I love these models. <laughs> this is one of our actual wind tunnel models that I have run in the wind tunnel at speeds of Mach 1.6 and 1.8. Wow. Um, so before we, yeah. you know, let's dive down into the details. Like what is when you're talking Mach speed? Like what is that? Okay. So Mach is the speed of the airplane relative to the speed of sound. So Mach 1 is at the speed of sound okay. at whatever altitude you're at. At cruising altitude, the speed of sound is about 660 miles an hour. So we tested this up to Mach 1.8, which is um, a little bit over 1,100 miles per hour in the wind tunnel. So I've stood outside the wind tunnel watching the wind go by, but of course you can't see it, you can't see wind, unless there's fog in the tunnel. But anyway, we watched this 
ride in the wind tunnel at those speeds. Okay. So um, you had mentioned the these, um, you know, wind tunnels. Like, why do we use them? Like, what's so special about them? It, they're great because you can test an airplane, either a full-size airplane or a scale model of it in flight. I mean, in the, on the ground instead of doing it in flight where... If you don't know what the aerodynamics of the airplane are going to be, you need to test in the tunnel to simulate the real physics of it and measure the aerodynamics of it. And in my case, we're measuring the sonic boom of, of these supersonic airliners. And so we can learn about those characteristics before we take the airplane to flight. Much safer that way. So, Delane, this is the first question right out of the gate. It's like, but why is that nose so long? So long. That is the best question Regarding something you are aircraft. winning the Twitch <laughs> chat so yes, far, Delane. Yes. Best question so far. Best question and so of course far. It's the first one. <laughs> anyway, the nose is so long because to design for a quiet sonic boom, you want <clears throat> weak shock waves up in front. You don't want any strong shock waves like the Concorde airliner and modern fighter aircraft. They do have sharp noses, but they're not nearly so long and slender as this. Mm -hmm. And so they produce a strong shock wave. A shock wave is a sudden pressure rise from one point to the next. And, and if you have a strong shock in the front, then the sonic boom is gonna be a very loud boom, boom sound. Yeah. And you can feel it thump your chest and all it that. It feels like an earthquake. It does. <laughs> I mean, I, I, when I was at NASA Armstrong over in the Mojave Desert and they were running test f yeah. like flights and there was sonic booms. It feels like a legit earthquake, like a 4.5, yeah. a five, like yeah. the whole building shakes. Yeah. But, it's of like, course, it's very short. Yes. It's less than one second, and then it's over with. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, you want weak shocks up in the front, and then the sonic boom will not be a strong, sudden pressure rise at the ground, but it'll be a gradual pressure rise, and that will sound more like a sonic thump. Thump, yeah. And it'll be much quieter, and, and it won't give the earthquake type mm -hmm. of uh, sensation. Oh, we got a bunch of questions that, that are coming okay. in. So we got Black Swarm says, how cool, and asks, what was the most ordinary or most unordinary thing you saw in a wind tunnel? Uh, actually, I've seen a picture of a submarine in a wind tunnel. Really? Yes. How does that work? <laughs> well, it's all fluid dynamics, right? Okay, the air scientific fluid, principles. Just like water is a fluid, so okay. you can measure the air, aerodynamics around a submarine. But I guess we're getting way off topic. I think, the cool, <laughs> I think the coolest thing that I've seen in the wind tunnel are these sonic boom models. Nice. You know, these are really nice looking models here. I'm hoping when I retire that NASA will let me take this home. <laughs> I was going to say, Soupy7 was asking, when will this fly for real? For real. Okay. That is a good question. Okay, this well, airplane. We're testing it. Yeah. Yeah, we're testing it. Um, NASA is working on a lot of technologies to enable future supersonic air travel. Right now it's banned from supersonic flight over land because mm -hmm. of the loudness of the sonic boom. Mm -hmm. But we're working on that. And so NASA's latest and greatest thing is that we're taking the lessons learned from the tests of these type of models and applying it to the next NASA X-plane, which would be the low boom flight demonstrator. And okay. speaking of that low boom flight yes. demonstrator, <laughs> yes. Bill, can we go ahead and Bill get and that Dave brought up for the on Yes. Wind. There, there's the picture of the low boom flight demonstrator. It's been designed by Lockheed Palmdale, um, along with uh, NASA people overseeing it. So that is being built right now. It was just started. It'll be flying in a little bit over three years from now. Okay. And that will be the first airplane in the world ever flown that was designed from scratch to have a quiet sonic boom. That's pretty cool. The boom level for modern fighter aircraft of the Concorde is like 100 to 110 decibels, mm -hmm. which is like a very loud rock concert or something. Mm -hmm. Boom level from the LBFD, the low boom flight demonstrator, is expected to be less than 75 decibels. Well, it, talk about realistically, how does that impact? So I, I'm like, I, I recently took a flight from San Francisco <laughs> to DC, and it was yeah. about like four or five hours, give yeah. or take. Mm -hmm. What would supersonics? What would that flight eventually look like? Well, if we're flying at twice the speed of the subsonic airliners, we'll get there in just a little bit more than half the time. Wow, so really like two hours. Well, not. Three it'll hours. be closer to three, I think, okay, okay. For, from here to D.C., but like from here to London, yeah. between five and six hours. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. That's a game changer. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> 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 I wanted to do that. So um, a whole bunch of questions. Let's see. Coronia is asking, what about the many wings and fins it has? So talk about um, some of that. Yeah. yeah, that's a good question here. So you can see the wing plan form. It's got a very sharp, uh, very highly swept wings here, and then the wings extend out. Then it has little winglets. You've seen the winglets on 
different like um, modern airplanes. Yeah, yeah, like 737s. They have a lot of winglets. So these are we call them V tails. If you look at this uh, view from the front here, then uh, you can see that they're up at a at about a 45 degree angle. They've served the function of both a horizontal stabilizer in the back as well as the vertical stabilizer. Mm -hmm. And there would be rudders on these to help steer the airplane as well as help it in banks and stuff. So a question just jumped up from the snack wrap is, is I know, right? These are <laughs> yeah. awesome names. Oh, they're great. Don, yeah. Don's getting a kick out of these. So yeah. the, well, the question is, like, would there be a big jump in turbulence as the plane hits the sonic boom? No. What is that like for people in the plane? Yeah. Well... If any of you have seen the movie The Right Stuff when Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier for the first time, it shows that the airplane shook a lot as he went through Mach 1. Mm -hmm. And that's true. It did shake a lot for him. Modern airplanes like the F-18 fighter or the F-15, they don't really shake as you go through Mach 1. They're designed to go supersonic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the turbulence is really very small. And yeah. I, think it, I think these would be even smoother. The Concorde apparently was very smooth as it went through Mach 1. Okay, so it looks like one of the questions that we have is, like, why wouldn't a simulation be sufficient for testing? That's from uh, Golden Luck. Mm, that, that's a good that's a good conversation because we have mm -hmm. both wind tunnels and supercomputers mm -hmm. that crunch numbers. Talk about that symbiotic relationship. Well, it's really a triad of yes. research. Okay. So back in the early days of aviation, we just ran things in the wind tunnel. We didn't have computers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we do wind tunnel tests, and that's using real air, so it's got the real physics. But it's a scale model, and there are compromises when you have a model like this. Um, for a computer simulation, we have the supercomputer, and they can predict many great features about the flow, but they're not quite the real thing. So we want to go to flight to really demonstrate it. And in particular, for the low boom flight demonstrator, we're not going to get the FAA and the whole international community to believe that we know how to design planes for a quiet sonic boom until we actually go up and fly it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do that in the years 2022 through 24, fly that airplane over communities all over the U.S. and get the public's reaction to the sonic thump from it. Yeah, It'll no, no longer be a sonic boom. So they're not going to believe it's just from the ground test data and from the computer simulation. Mm -hmm. They'll believe it when we actually fly an airplane and they can stand out there and hear it with their own ears. Okay. So, Mr. Man 124 is, if I want to work at NASA, do you think a degree in aerospace engineering would help me get recruited? <laughs> oh, yeah, like 100%. <laughs> kind of like the whole point, Mr. Man. Yeah, that's what my degrees are in, aerospace engineering. <laughs> and I got the job. In fact, I'll be nice retiring flex. soon. If, if, you, if you want my job, come and take it in a few years. Okay, well, Matt, <laughs> I think we have time for about one more question okay. before we do have to say bye to Don. Okay. Let's hit this from sometimes I lie is like would this technology eventually be used on commercial airliners? I guess that's oh, the whole idea. That is the whole point. So there will probably be supersonic business jets first, mm -hmm. and there are some companies that that are starting to make those. They think that they're going to be flying them for the public within five or maybe eight years or so. I'm not sure there's going to be low boom like the uh, LBFD will be, but um, there'll be business jets first for the rich and famous, mm -hmm. and then they'll build airliners. And granted, ticket prices will be high, but hopefully in the coming decades, ticket prices will come down. It's kind of how okay. like normal aviation kind of <laughs> yeah. It's kind totally. of how it works. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us, Don. Well, it's been a pleasure. And uh, just as it. a reminder, you're watching NASA in Silicon Valley live. And if you have any questions for our guests, feel free to write them in the chat. So up next, we're going to go ahead and up bring next. out Faisal. Faisal. So come on out. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, he. Uh, <laughs> look at him flexing on everybody else, bringing the biggest gift. I had to. I've seen all the other <laughs> gifts. That's it. I got to get the bigger one. Okay, like, I'm so, not messing uh, around. Faisal, like, tell us a little bit about, you, uh, about yourself and some of the research that you do here. Sure. So I'm a, I'm a research engineer here at the uh, Aerospace Operation Laboratory. I mainly do research in air traffic management and air traffic systems for both manned and unmanned. Uh, I also do outreach events, and on top of that, whenever we do a flight test and it's in the field, uh, I do and support those flight tests as a human factors engineer. Okay, so Matt, let's go ahead and let's let's take sure. a look at what we brought right. here. Can I like, get? <laughs> That's really sad. <laughs> <laughs> like my lack of fingernails is okay. Here we go. And I and I look at Faisal's face to see if he's like, <laughs> too much, bro. You need to stop. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
<laughs> All right. Here Come on, Matt. You can do a little better I got than this. that. My present game, opening game, is, is weak. <laughs> All right. And Kayvon swore. He was like, oh, no, it's a very gentle tape. You should be, able, be fine. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Okay. Take Matt, a look like at what's this. What's going on in there? This is what everybody in the chat is, I'm sure, hoping to get for Christmas. Bring this right. bad boy on out. Ooh. There we go. Take Place a look at here. that. So, so uh, like, what's obviously everybody everyone wants a drone. Is, everyone wants a drone. Everyone knows what it is, but like, why drones? Like, why is NASA getting involved in this research? Well, as you just mentioned, you know, drones are becoming a hot topic out there, and not only for commercial use, but also for government use, public safety, and the general public. And so when you have so many drones up in the air, you need to have a way to manage them. Yeah. And Ames, going to, to talk a little bit about Ames, Ames has a long history uh, in air traffic management research and air traffic um, uh, uh, system research as well. So they actually took the challenge into developing uh, an air traffic management system for drones. Okay. So, um, so you said that we have this drone traffic system, but like, how is it different from air traffic control? Like, is it a software based or is it hardware based? It's yeah, it's a good good question. So it's a a, a cloud uh, software based, and uh, it's different because we're talking about hundreds of thousands of drones flying in the air. So with the air traffic management we use for manned aviation today, you actually have a controller on the ground controlling each of the aircraft. So when you have hundreds of thousands of these drones flying, it's going to be very difficult for those controllers to manage all of those drones, right? So what NASA decided, or NASA Ames, we decided to come up with a, a fully autonomous cloud-based system, software system, that would do most of the job with uh, automation. Okay. So I was going to say, so if we can get Mark and Jesse, we have Wobbly Waffle over here is, is yelling in the chat saying, zoom in on the drone, Dave. <laughs> so I'm going to say Mark and Jesse, there we go. And then Dave is going to switch it, switch over to that. Okay. So, uh, you know, as you know, drones come in different sizes and shapes and performances, right? Mm -hmm. You can have drones that could fit in the palm of your, your hand to drones that are as big as a, a manned aviation. So, okay. yeah. so what we have here actually is a quadcopter. You have four mm -hmm. rotors here. And each, these drones could have different payloads, right? And for this example, you have a place here for a camera where you can place a camera here. But others could have like airborne radar. So you can have drones that would do delivery as well. Okay. So yeah, I mean, talk a little bit about it. I mean. I mean, we know that like there's the air traffic controllers which are human based mm -hmm. and they're very busy and very stressed. Mm -hmm. um, and you can imagine they're not going to have a good time if you start flooding the airspace and they're tracking hundreds, thousands and thousands of drones. So that's the whole idea of like mm -hmm. this traffic management is like, what is an automated traffic management for drones? So that's a software? And, like, yeah, it's a software based, uh, but in terms of like, there's rules that we have to follow mm -hmm. in this okay. software. Uh, for example, you know, one of the first things we got to look at is how do you, uh, so what do you do when you're using this, uh, the software, right? You would submit an operational volume, you know, yeah. and, or you can think about it as a safe zone. Okay. So yeah. you're telling the system you, uh, your intention. So I'm going to fly in this area between this time and this time. So okay. that's one, the first thing that you would do. Um, another thing that you do also is like, how do, I do we avoid these drones from hitting each other, right? Yeah. And how do we avoid having these drones get, and get in the way of manned aviations, right? Like uh, okay. GA or uh, uh, general aviation av uh, aircraft or helicopters. I'm also sure people on the ground aren't <laughs> going to want to hear buzzing over their houses nonstop, mm -hmm. you know? Exactly, right? So one way is to share those intentions and also technologies that would be part of this uh, uh, type of drones. A third thing that we're looking at is priority, uh, priority, priority, uh, priority operations. Okay. So we're okay. talking about public safety in this case, right? Uh, I'm thinking police. search and rescue might get priority over mm -hmm. a pizza. Yeah, so they would have a <laughs> higher credential, right? Uh, so if you think of, I'll give you an example. So you have hundreds of thousands fly, of drones flying in the air, and you have uh, different applications from delivery to railroad inspection, and so on, and there's a, um, uh, an emergency, a fire emergency. So the fire department would want to send their drones up. Okay. So 
what would happen is they would have a higher priority uh, credential. Once they submit that, anything that actually gets on the way of that operation would get messages, right? Get out of the way. Okay. For example, like when you're driving yeah. on the road today and you hear mm -hmm. a fire uh, truck behind you with a siren, mm -hmm. what would you do? What would you, you, do? Know you, get over. you would move out of the way. Of so the way. it's the same concept there. Okay, so I actually think we have a really cool video if you guys. Nice. Hey, Bill, can we get sure. that brought up? Ooh, so, looky, looky. So this is one of the automations we use for uh, UT, the UTM project. Um, so you see those, the red area is that operation volume or... Uh, uh, or safe zone, as you would say, and then you see the little drone flying, and those da darker spots that's behind the drones is like the positions update that is sent in the system, right? We want to know okay. where the drone is mm -hmm. and what it's doing. And again, this is a, uh, an application like an agriculture, so you can see it's scanning the fields. So like the, the, the mm -hmm. UTM, the, the traffic management knows mm -hmm. where all the drones are all the time, makes for sure they're not clashing, keeping them in where they need to go. Exactly. So that's the idea, is sharing your intention to those that needs to know. We have a ton of questions. One is from, oh, and I just clicked on a button, but all right. Does the quadcopter configurations have any advantages over a tricopter design? Uh, well, no, uh, not in- Does it uh, matter? Yeah, it doesn't matter. They're all, it's, it's mostly like fixed wings versus non-fixed wings, right? They, uh, in terms of like, if you have more rotors, uh, if you lose one, you can still fly. Mm -hmm. So it's safety reasons that, that would fly a little bit better. And a, a wicked dender is asking, what practical applications have been implemented? Search and rescue, land surveys? Uh, well, we we test different use cases in our tests. So we do a lot of our testing at six fields across the nation, uh, six test sites across the nation. We do it in uh, New York, Virginia, Texas, North Dakota, Alaska, and uh, Nevada. Each of the test sites has their own unique characteristic in terms of environment, you know, from the hot to the cold, mm -hmm. from the high elevation to the low uh, elevation. And so in those test sites, we do um, search and rescue scenarios. We do, uh, we also did public safety, other public safety as fire emergency scenarios or um, cell, uh, cell tower inspection type of yeah. scenarios, mm -hmm. delivery type of scenarios. So we do a lot of those scenarios in the, at the test sites. So there's a question that just jumped in. Um, this is from Resonator Games is asking, what's the process for moving a consumer product like a drone into serious research by NASA? Well, uh, at, most of our flying is done by our partners, right? This yeah. does, uh, this, what's unique about this project is we work very closely with the, our partners or the industry and the FAA. And so those partners are actually flying drones, drones that are very similar to this to drones mm -hmm. that are much larger. So in terms of like what you would see in a real uh, retail st store or online, you can find these any, just by searching. You can buy them there. Okay. Right. How are we looking at time? We got one last question. Ooh, I'm going to pick a good one. Um, well, let's hear it. This is Golden Luck is asking, um, what would happen if a rogue drone in, uh, interfered during a task? Uh, we've, that's a good question, actually. Good question, so, Golden uh, Luck. We have rules in terms of like when drones are actually following the rules and what would happen if one of them actually gets out of the way, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so when we talked about the safe zones or the operation volumes, if that drone or operate uh, or the operator uh, of the drone gets out of that operation volume messages will be sent out to everybody that is going to affect <laughs> right so uh, it allows the other drone operators to act appropriately if they need to get out of the way land so yeah that's that's a rogue state of a drone and so we make sure that messages are sent out to the right people that need to know about it Okay. Well, right, look at thank you, Faisal, for thank definitely for joining me. us. And right. as a reminder, you're watching uh, NASA in Silicon Valley Live. And if you have any questions for our guests, please write it in the chat. And we're <laughs> going to go ahead and bring out our next guest. Next guest. Who, who's uh, up? We've got Vade. Vade. Vade is coming out with another awesome shirt. <laughs> Save the best for last. Yes, yes. exactly. 
it made it, 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 I think I don't know if Kayvon has the link, but we also did a podcast a while back, it wasn't did. that? Was that like a year ago or so? Or I think so. That's about, about that time. Ago. We <laughs> so yeah. Like so, we, well, for those that have not met you before, like tell us a little bit about yourself. Like what what area of research do you do here at Ames? Sure. So my name is Dr. Vaith Triath, and I direct something called the Laboratory for Advanced Sensing in the Earth Sciences Division. Okay. So I get a really cool job. I get nice. to invent new imaging technologies and try to explore things we haven't seen yet on planet Earth. Oh, excellent. <laughs> so are, are we jumping into we this are, now? We are, we <laughs> are. This, and this is the last gift, this right? Is. All right. Well, you, you're competing <laughs> with the drone right now. <laughs> All right, let me get this. <laughs> Come on, Matt. I know. We will recycle this material we, afterwards. It, of course, yes. Right. Well, and I just realized as I throw all the boxes behind me <laughs> that I've almost ruined Dave and Bill's set design over here. Shame. Um, so, all right. Ooh, 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 that's a pretty cool one. We got some toys in here, <laughs> and I'm gonna look over at Vade to let us know. All right, you brought me a camera. Yes, I did. <laughs> here very, you go. Very Why nice don't you camera. grab that? Don't be shy. Tell us what we're looking at over here. So this is called the NASA Fluid Cam Instrument. And what it is is um, one of the first technologies able to look through ocean waves. Okay. So what I specialize in right now is studying systems, um, particularly in the ocean, that we haven't been able to see before from satellites or aircraft. And actually, as of 2018, we've been able to map all of the Mars, all of Mars and the Moon um, in optical wavelengths, but we have only mapped about five percent of the seafloor. Okay. And so this is one of the first instruments that's able to get down and look through ocean waves that really cause problems when we try to image systems like coral reefs or kelp forests. Yeah, and I know like when you're looking at through those oceans, like looking mm -hmm. at coral reefs, mm -hmm. and you know you have the waves, you have this, all this distortion. That's the thing you've been working quite a bit on of like an algorithm, or how do you end up like getting through that noise? I guess. Sure. So actually, if, if you go to a swimming pool, you can see this phenomena pretty um, commonly. In fact, I think I have a video showing a simulation of the phenomena on our supercomputer. This is the part where we're like, Dave, Bill, <laughs> yeah, look at that. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Um, so if you, if you look on the left, you'll actually see what a typical image looks like from a drone or from an aircraft or spacecraft looking down at the ocean. There's a lot of reflection from the surface of the ocean, as well as distortions caused by these waves. And those distortions can move um, um, or move the apparent location of things underwater, which mm -hmm. makes it very difficult to study anything that's underwater over time because you, it, things appear to be moving and you can't actually resolve them very well. So what this instrument's capable of doing is, is create the picture on the right, which is a very clear uh, 3D yeah. picture of an entire marine environment. In this case, this is from um, a campaign we did in American Samoa where we're looking at a coral reef ecosystem. And you can see you know, so what's really underneath the surface is tremendous. There's a huge amount of biodiversity. Sparko Fuin is asking, how deep can this camera see? That, that's a great question. So uh, we use passive light, reflected sunlight off of the surface of the ocean. Unfortunately, because of the properties of water, mm -hmm. sunlight only goes down to about 100 meters depth. Uh, what we mm -hmm. call the photic zone. That's where the majority of, of photosynthetic organisms in the ocean are located. Okay, so but that means that we can only see down to a depth of about 100 meters okay. with this instrument. Omnislash79 was asking that. Like, NASA, can it map the marina trench? How deep can it map? So. Sure. So the first 100 meters is really just the surface of the ocean. Uh, the average depth of the ocean is 4,000 meters. So it's a long way to go. <laughs> and we actually have another instrument that perhaps I'll talk about next time that's designed to look in the, in the deep sea environments and be able to illuminate them. But so, even if you look at the, mm -hmm. the first 30 meters of water, um, and you go from the coastline and you march out, that encompasses an area of Earth that's larger than the land area of Earth. It's really a huge region. Um, and those regions are very productive biologically. Mm -hmm. They're responsible for a lot of climate-related uh, changes in our environment. So it's, it's very important to understand what they look like and how they change over time. Looking at Danielle. Well, actually, he just answered. I was going to ask, like, <laughs> oh, no. why, why, why study the oceans? Because so well, yeah, uh, go ahead. Sure. Uh, to me, it, it, it is fascinating. My background is actually in astrophysics, and I was very keen to look for life elsewhere in the universe, only to realize when I got to the field that we've, we've barely scratched the surface on Earth. There are tremendous uh, discoveries to be made yet in the ocean, mega squid, uh, cephalopods, sperm whales, you name it, plate-sized amoebas. There's just a lot of biodiversity in our own backyard that unfortunately we're losing uh, very quickly. And unless we develop new instruments, new technologies to map the sea floor, we really, we won't have a good grasp on the life that we know that exists on our own planet. 
And this is a cool, like, like, the intersection of astrophysics and then, like, Earth science. This goes to Space TV Net. It was asking, uh, could a device like this see through ice? Could something similar be used on spacecraft like the Europa Clipper, like, spacecraft? That's also a great question. I would love if it could see through <laughs> ice. Ice is even more challenging. You can't uh, prove it doesn't. <laughs> I can't prove it doesn't. Um, but one of the interesting features on Earth that this instrument utilizes is there's sort of a happenstance we have with the properties of water and air and gravity that when you see waves uh, at a swimming pool or on the ocean, they form these natural lenses. And those lenses appear to magnify an object or demagnify an object. Okay. And this instrument's capable of, of using those traveling lenses as microscopes to see deeper in the water column. So unfortunately, if you, if you change one of the parameters um, of the Earth system, let's say you replace the oceans with alcohols, um, the properties are different, and they don't actually form lenses in the way that, that the ocean does. So it's really quite fortunate that we have the physics that we do on our, on our yeah. surface, um, but definitely the, we're looking at exploring um, to use, using this technique on, on different worlds and places like Titan where there's liquid hydrocarbons. Well, and one of the questions that come in, and it, and it may be answered by the algorithm and mm -hmm. by the stuff that you're working on, is like, are photos generally taken directly above to minimize the effects from re um, refractive index, or does that not matter? Yes. Uh, so someone knows their physics well. <laughs> so <laughs> Somebody's <if> you... <laughs> flexing on the rest of the chat, <laughs> so go ahead. Uh, if, you, if you try to, actually, if you swim underneath a, a pool and you look up, you'll notice that there's a certain angle at which light appears to reflect off the surface. So mm -hmm. there's really a, a sweet spot in where you want to image so that light doesn't completely reflect off the surface or cause internal reflection. Typically, uh, when we fly this instrument, this flies on, on drones, yeah. um, a little larger than the one that Faisal was showing, but we fly them over corals using those drones and they typically look nadir uh, straight down. Okay, so someone actually wants to know, can this be used to locate the garbage in the oceans? Yes, and that's, <laughs> we've uh, we've caught a lot of uh, marine debris, what we call the trash of the that's ocean, a, in our data That's a very sets. kind <laughs> way to put it. <laughs> marine debris, okay. Marine debris, yes, yeah, she's a crafty lady, and uh, she... <laughs> Debris is really scattered, unfortunately, among a lot of the reef systems we're looking at. Uh, we see a lot of coral. Uh, we actually have uh, large data sets that we can comb through and count uh, the percentage of coral in an area or sand. And we see a lot of tires, a lot of used plastics that unfortunately brush up on the reef during storm events and stay there. So a question, this is electromagnetism. How and why would you use this camera to study the health of reefs? Sure. So really, this system's the first that's been able to image them uh, robustly mm -hmm. through different sea states. So by looking at them at the scales that they grow at, which is typically one centimeter per year, this would be for coral reefs, we can really understand how they're changing as a function of changing sea temperatures or climates. Um, the data sets it produces are very similar to what you would see if you were diving in a reef system. And we haven't had that ability to survey ecosystems mm -hmm. at that scale over large areas before. Typically, we, we would send teams of divers to study in a region for about a week, oh, uh, which is nice. <laughs> now we can send a drone over and actually map that whole island. Um, and actually, those, those data sets can be very large. And we have a, um, a video game coming out next year nice, that allows nice. you to fly around You've and explore. You've come to the right place. Those, yes. <laughs> well, on sitting on Twitch. That's true. And... We hope you all play it. It's called uh, NemoNet. And you'll okay. be able to fly around our 3D data sets of coral. And actually, you get trained uh, by a few scientists. And you can start painting and coloring coral in 3D. And that data helps us understand where the reef we is. We need a game awards, Jeff <laughs> Keighley style of like, Premiere trailer or something like that coming up. That could be like an iOS kind of thing or like mm -hmm. on a phone or is it a, on a, like a, an app or something? Sure. So right now we've developed it for iOS and Android uh, okay. as well as for desktops. We have a large gaming table that's multi-touch. Um, so we really just want users to be able to see the corals as if you were a fish in that system and be able to also help classify it. Because one of the challenges with these ecosystems is, one, we don't have really good data about them. Yeah, yeah. And the data that we do have is so complex um, in diversity that it's very hard to classify by humans. So we, we could have teams of graduate students you know, painstakingly going through and classifying them, or we can open it up to the public. Oh, wow. And then you just, it's just like, you open source it, everybody else. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, we, we, we are fans of doing video game episodes we over are. here. So w when it comes out, we'll need to have you come on in and we'll start, you can show everybody how sure. to play it. And start. There are ratings in the game. So whoever classifies <laughs> it best starts ranking up. You have leaderboards. <laughs> leaderboards. <laughs> and yes. you got to put trophies in it. And you got to do the whole thing. So we actually, we have a really cool question um, from Hawk. 
uh, Vel, he wants to know, is this instrument backed by supercomputers or is it completely standalone? That's another good question. So when I started developing the algorithm as a doctoral student, uh, it required a lot of computational power. Uh, fortunately, I was also interning at NASA Ames and using, <laughs> abusing the supercomputer. So it started its life there. Um, and then that's actually one of the reasons why we developed this instrument. We needed a lot of compute power uh, on board because okay. we're recording um, thousands of frames per second of image data. And then that data is being processed to just produce one high resolution 2D picture for a region. So really, this is a, a flying computer, and this can perform a lot of those computations on board, owing to all the GPUs and CPUs that we've packed in there. I think Santiago's asking, why the USB ports? Mm -hmm. Is that yeah. to get the data out? <laughs> yes, yeah, so this we've taken off some of the, the um, hardware <laughs> so you can see the guts of the instrument. But to take the data out, we actually just rip the hard drives directly out because oh, really? it, it's too slow to transfer otherwise. And that's why we put so much computing power on board is so that we can process the data, delete what we don't need, and, and only send down um, the final data sets. So when okay. we eventually put this up into orbit to test in the space environment, we can start pulling down data without clogging up all of our Okay. <laughs> Bra Brandon, not safe for work, is asking if this is going to be better than League of Legends. I don't know if you're a League <laughs> player or not. I don't know, but I can tell you that the views that this thing affords are much more interesting. <laughs> so. we get, get ready for the eSports version. <laughs> we have teams competing on who can like classify the most, the fastest. I'm liking it. So, um, okay, Rasonic was also asking, will the video game ever be used to perform citizen science on the data collected? Yes, so that's we, the whole idea, we right? do. We, we want you to classify the corals because we really can't all do it ourselves. Um, there's a citizen science component of the game where users get trained and they start classifying it. We have a lot of error correction. Mm -hmm. So users that are very good, we have a lot of um, examples of coral that have been classified by experts. Those can be, can be sort of used as references for other players to rate them. And then as users get better, we give them harder and harder data sets. Okay. So oh, there's wow. a form of active learning in the game where we, we give them all the hard cases. Um, and then that feeds into classification. Way more interesting than getting a whole bunch of students and interns coming in <laughs> <laughs> and brute forcing it. So, so I uh, think we have time for one last question. One last question before, before, we, before we wrap up. We, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> well, I go, waka, waka, waka. <laughs> All right, let's go for, OK, let's get a good one. All right, so Golden Luck has been doing pretty good so far. Is the camera purely a digital camera, or does it capture IR data points? Ah, uh, good question. So infrared, unfortunately, doesn't penetrate uh, through the ocean surface. Water mm -hmm. absorbs uh, most of it within the first micron of the surface, which is why it's so hard to study the oceans, because we just have a narrow band of light in the visible um, to blue and ultraviolet that actually gets down into the water column. So this is primarily an uh, ultraviolet to, I would say, late, far red or near-infrared instrument to study things that go through underwater. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's so, pretty cool. I think we're at about that time, am I we right? It is, it is time for us to wrap up and say goodbye, Matt. This is about that time. Uh, thanks so much, Faith. This has been really <laughs> cool. So this is an awesome camera. You can just sit tight right Art. there. Uh, as, I, as I get to like look at my, look, all my gifts that I've gotten. <laughs> so, folks, this has been NASA in Silicon Valley Live. It is a conversational show um, from NASA's Ames Research Center in Silicon Valley, where we talk to the various scientists, researchers, engineers, and all-around cool people, like my buddy Vade over here. Uh, we talk about all the nerdy NASA news that you know about, that you want to learn know about, and if you like it, we are live on twitch.tv slash NASA. Didn't catch us live? Don't you worry about it. It is right after the show is over it'll be available on demand on twitch and on youtube and you'll also be catching reruns over on nasa tv um, if you're an audio listener we'll have it on podcast services throughout the solar system and beyond so a huge thanks to our guests and especially everybody who's sitting in the chat who submitted a ton of questions over this last little bit um, we're going to be back on thursday as normal but it's going to be a couple days from now thursday it is january 31st is going to be our next episode and we're going to be talking about making new discoveries with NASA's supercomputers. Like normal computers, but super. But until then, thank you so much for joining us in the chat. So much. Thank you so much to our guests. Thanks so much for coming. And we will see you guys in about a month. Bye. <laughs>